Hello, welcome to all our support fibro friends. This is an exciting episode of Fibromyalgia Research in Action. I'm thrilled to welcome our very special guest today, Dr. Daniel Kruger from the University of Michigan and Tyler Dautrick from More Better. Welcome everyone. Um, we're looking forward to this information. So many of our support fibro friends have seen us share the latest research project on cannabis for fibromyalgia and we had some questions. So we thought we'd bring in the people behind the research to share more information for all of you. So let's dive in. Um, Tyler, I do want to start with you because you reached out and just maybe give us the higher level context of this project. So how did it first get started? Yeah, sure. And first off, thanks for having us on here. This is exciting. We're looking forward to diving in. Um, so some background on, on how this started and just like what we do. So we've been operating since 2016. Our first kind of big thing in the market was the Relief app is what we're most kind of widely known for. And that's an application for cannabis and CBD patients and consumers to track the product that they're using, the symptoms and conditions they're using that product for, and then the outcomes that they've experienced. And the whole goal is like help people just make better decisions about their treatment so they, they can find better relief. And what we've started to do with that since like 2017 is, you know, if we're getting this data on how effective different products are for different symptoms and reasons, how can we help advance research with that? And we started to work with different universities to do studies on the data. And that led to nine different studies being published in different medical journals across a wide range of different like symptoms and conditions. And, you know, to get kind of fast forward a little bit into this particular study that we're talking about now with um, Dan and his team at the University of Michigan, we, I think, Dan, we were probably talking off and on for a couple of years about <laughs> ways that we could collaborate on, on research. And we've always seemed to be aligned on like, okay, you know, chronic pain is a really interesting area, but like, what can we actually do? And I think last year in 2021 is when we really honed in on layers. There seems to be a gap in the data. There's data out there and there's evidence that's like, okay, cannabis and CBD can help relieve some type of pain. But there's really little data and evidence on when we talk about that, like what specific formulation in products, what specific administration form, and what specific dosing actually equates into symptom relief and overall efficacy in general, but then specifically into when we talk about different types of chronic pain, like fibromyalgia, for example. And that's really kind of the birth of, of this study is like we identified and really agreed on like, yeah, that's definitely a gap. And the industry is at a point now where specifically like what we're looking at with this study, if you look at capsules and tablets, you can get really accurate dosing and product formulation information because one, you can ask people, did they take a full tablet or half a tablet? And you can get really accurate on like how much they consumed. And because they're a tablet or a capsule, you know the formulation is going to be very accurate kind of batch over batch over batch where obviously something like a cannabis flower you know there's a wide range of variability there on like batch to batches um and yeah we we landed on that being a really interesting topic and something that could one just be interesting for you know scientific and research publication reasons but also provide a lot of just real world actionable you know help for patients and practitioners on like if I'm a patient with fibromyalgia or a patient with RA or a patient with OA or even the practitioner side, like, you know, cannabis and CBD continue to be things that you probably hear about in the news of like, oh, you know, this is this new cannabinoid therapy is, is awesome relief. But like I walk into a dispensary and there's arguably thousands of different products that I could buy from. So like, where do I even begin to one, select a product, let alone know how much of that product I should start using. So if we can start to do, start to lay the groundwork with this study on at least, you know, either highly disqualifying or qualifying some of those guidelines there. Um, you know, one, I think that's a win on our end. And, and if nothing else, sets the stage for a lot of continuous studies to get more rigorous and, and provide more insight on there. Um, Dan, I don't know if you have anything to add on that, but I guess that was my- That's a fantastic thing. summary. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I saw that differentiation when you posted on LinkedIn as well of just explaining it. And it's it's very important because it can get super confusing. We right. get a lot of questions on like, what do I even take? Or they walk into a dispensary. What's best for chronic pain and fibromyalgia? And then you're always given a different answer depending on who you talk to, because right. some people respond differently. Others are more sensitive. So I, I'm glad that this research is getting done. And I'm excited. That's why we had to share it too to all our <laughs> support fibro friends and learn more. 
Awesome. Glad we're all mutually excited. <laughs> yes. Well, it, it's just, we understand the impact and the importance, but breaking it down, just like you said, it is part of the process that everybody needs to understand. And yeah, if, exactly. It, if it opens up more research, then it's, it's even better and seeing how we can support you in our fibromyalgia community, even doing the advocacy work that we're doing. Yeah. I mean, I think on our side, you know, outside of the the research, it's like, yeah, it's great if, if the research comes back as solid and it leads to, you know, publication opportunities. But it's again, like, how can we leverage this data that we're collecting to help patients make better decisions? And whether that's a better purchasing decision, whether that's a better overall treatment decision, like, you know, let's get this data out there and just allow people to make better decisions with it. Fantastic. That's wonderful to hear. Um, Dr. Kruger, can you tell us more about your research background and how you got inspired to be involved with the project? Sure. So I'm an academic researcher and I work in a whole range of areas. So on the very theoretical side, I study evolutionary biology and how that uh, you know is related to human psychology and behavior. And on the very applied side, I do a lot of collaborative work, especially community-based work. So partnering with communities to perform research that is going to bring some kind of direct benefit back to that community. So oftentimes, you know, academics are very much about expanding knowledge and understanding things, which is really great. But I like to do things that are going to help people too. And that's why I get involved in the applied work as well. Uh, so I've been, you know, involved in, in this area for a few decades and, you know, presenting at various kinds of conferences and being involved in different, you know, different fields. Uh, there is uh, a lot of, uh, you know, work in public health that, uh, you know, we've been working on. So I would be going to these public health conferences and I would see a lot of presentations about cannabis, but they were all very much in the mindset of, cannabis as a harmful substance uh you know it's kind of framed in the same context as tobacco or uh you know some such and and it's understandable because there's a lot of folks in public health who you know are working on health issues related to tobacco or uh you know binge alcohol drinking or some such and you know they really want to uh, you know prevent harms to people uh but it was very much in in this mindset you know where we have abstinence-based programs and, you know, what are all the possible harms for cannabis? So kind of treating like cannabis like it was tobacco, but also that it's illegal so people could get in legal trouble for it. You know, I started asking people, well, now California has legalized cannabis for medicinal use. So now millions of people have legal access to it and they're using it to treat all sorts of different health and medical conditions. So what's the public health framework for that because the you know, the true mission of public health is really to you know maximize benefits and minimize the cost risks and harms to both individuals and society so if people are using cannabis medicinally there's a lot of things that really we really want to know about it just think about how much effort it takes to get uh like a pharmaceutical drug to market you know all the different phases of clinical trials answering those kinds of questions that Tyler brought up about dosages, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, it, we, we knew virtually nothing about this. Uh, and when I talked to people about it, they seemed to just be stunned. Like they, you know, they, they thought, oh, well, you know, we don't think that's a good idea or, uh, you know, sometimes even laughing it off. Um, but it was pretty clear that there, there was this huge gap uh, that needed to be filled, you know, uh, legalized cannabis and people who are using cannabis medicinally, uh, you know, as a huge area, someone has to, you know, someone has to investigate that and answer these kinds of questions. And, you know, I guess it's us, right? Because no, at the time, uh, you know, very few people were doing it. This was not, you know, take, you know, taking cannabis seriously as medicine was not a perspective that you really saw in the, you know, mainstream academic public health. So we started to work along those lines uh, with some very, you know, exploratory studies at first, but then, you know, have building, been building a research program and then, uh, you know, connecting, connecting with other folks and investigating a lot of interesting issues. 
Uh, so you know the history of fibromyalgia and centralized pain. You know, this is something that has been a puzzle for the medical community, you know, for, for a long time. There's a lot of, there was a lot of issues of, of getting recognized. So, you know, there's no, there's no tissue damage that you can find. So what is, what is going on? People are still really trying to understand and find the best treatments for these uh, chronic overlapping pain conditions. And traditional interventions are not as effective as we'd like them to be. In comes this new opportunity because pain is one of the main conditions that people use medical cannabis to treat. We know that from our own research and for, for different from other research groups have found this. And the National Academies of Science and Engineering and Medicine, so basically the US, you know, the official US Science Academy uh, did a review of the cannabis literature a few years ago, and they concluded that pain is one of the conditions, you know, chronic pain is one of the conditions that cannabis is effective in treating, right? Period. The question is, okay, so cannabis is effective at treating chronic pain, but we want to know all the details of what is the, you know, what is the best formulation? Uh, what is the best dosage, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot, there's a lot more uh, to follow up just that basic statement that, okay, cannabis is effective. You know, how do we, how do we optimize effectiveness? And that's, you know, that's what this study is about. And I think it's a, it's ideal to have a cross-sector partnership because it really enables the research that needs to be done uh, in ways that helps work around the restrictions, given that cannabis is still illegal at the federal level, right? It's still a schedule one uh, substance, which is, which makes it incredibly difficult, uh, you know, for for people to actually research it and conduct the kind of you know clinical trials that we we'd really want to see. So having this cross sector partnership is really beneficial because it enables this the, it enables this work, and at the same time you have the the independence of academic collaborators. You know, so people who. You know, my, my job is not on the line based on the results of this study, right? I'm optimistic about it. I, I see the value. That's why I'm in this area because I, I think, I think there is a lot of potential, but you know, we, we follow the science and we use the best science possible and we follow the data and that, you know, and, and for that, hopefully people have, uh, you know, greater level of trust when you have an academic, you know, research collaboration rather than just a company who might be, you know, running its own studies and, and finding its own findings. Because if people are internal, maybe they might have pressure to find the, you know, find the results that the company wants, right? Uh, so I think, so I'm, hope, so I'm hoping that that, uh, you know, helps build trust. And this is in part, is it's a collaboration with the University of Michigan's Chronic Pain and uh, Fatigue Research Center. So my colleague, uh, you know, Kevin Benke and, you know, folks, these these are the people who have been studying fibromyalgia and and have been taking it seriously for decades. Uh, you know, so these <laughs> it's getting like the dream team together. You know, I'm just very excited about this project and you know what we'll find and then what will what directions will go in the future. I'm excited for that optimism. Thank you so much for sharing because we we talk about this lot in the patient community and there is some sort of magic energy that's coming out of Michigan because we had a lot of fibromyalgia advocates join mm -hmm. us. So there's a lot of energy coming from there, which kind of leads me into my next question with even patients getting involved, not only with the research, but we were digging into some of the NIH research and we're seeing more investment and we're seeing more investment in cannabis treatment and we want it to be translated. So are there areas, I guess, when it comes to supporting research that patients can be more involved with? Is it going to our representatives and continue to ask for this at Capitol Hill? Or are there other things that patients can get involved with? Yeah, that would certainly help. Uh, you guys are actually probably more expert on the advocacy side, but you know, just getting the message out there also uh, you know, the more the more voices we can get to say we really need to reschedule cannabis, get it out of that schedule one classification. Uh, we would really like to see, you know, cannabis legalized at the national level. Uh, and and that's 
that would resolve a lot of the problematic issues that we have when there's, you know, inconsistent regulations from state to state, because, uh, you know, things have happened differently in different states. And, uh, you know, sometimes there's a real, there's a real mismatch between what's going on in, in one area and another. So uh, those are some of the key things that, uh, you know, we'd really like to see, you know, happen in advocacy efforts and just, just extending the message that, you know, medical cannabis is something that we should take seriously, right? So um, it's a, it's, and it is really sort of a new framework for people because for so long, uh, you know, cannabis was just seen as this recreational drug that's illegal. Uh, so I think this is something that, you know, more and more people are getting in tune with, but it's a, a message that we, we really want to get out there as well. Yeah, just to, to piggyback off of that and maybe kind of take it to the other end. So like one, I, I definitely agree. I think first off, Melissa, you're probably much more uh, expertise in, in the advocacy side than, than we are. So I don't know if we should be giving you advice, <laughs> but, but um, my two cents is like for sure anything, you know, of like people going to their representatives and, you know, whatnot and advocating on one, just lowering the barrier of research and allowing research to be done. But two, I think what Dan says on, um, you know, descheduling cannabis, I think that's like super critical in my opinion, when my two cents on the whole legalization conversation is that, you know, I, I'd much, much rather see it descheduled than anything else. I think rescheduling it or reclassifying it leads to a whole other world of problems and headaches where it should be de descheduled period. But I think, you know, that's a whole battle over here, right? I think another interesting thing that could happen on the other side is, between patients and just like the industry is, you know, look, at the end of the day, these industry players, the the brands and the retailers, you know, at the end of the day, they're they're a direct to consumer brand in a certain respect that needs to sell product, right? Like that's that's their bottom line, regardless if they're a medical dispensary or in an adult use state, like they need to sell product to consumers to to stay open. And, you know, shout out honestly to the two sponsors that we have that are, are participating in this study with us, Level and Overcome, because I think it's very few brands from our perspective, and we're, we're much more on the data, research, medical slash just overall health and wellness side than we are on like the adult use, like help you find a quick high side of things. And, you know, surprisingly, um, there's very few brands that share that mentality of like, hey, we're, we're really trying to bring quality, efficacious products to the market where we're super transparent on the use and performance of those products because we're really trying to provide true relief to like very specific patient and consumer communities, right? Like I know on, on our side, just having conversations with whether it's a dispensary or whether it's a brand or what have you, you know, more often than not, the, the response that we get is like, look, I'm selling weed and whatever product I have on the shelf is going to sell. I don't really care how it performs. And like, okay, you know, that may be true now and may be true in some markets, but like, that's not always going to be true. And I think that's one thing like from the patient and the consumer side is, you know, we can start to demand and, and move towards these brands that are taking more of this, you know, let's not even continue to use the word medical. Like obviously for this conversation, it's medical research, but even just like, you know, general wellness and, and just overall mindfulness to this, right? Like we're trying to sell you more or less a functional wellness product to a certain extent. And, you know, let's, I think there's an opportunity from the patient and the consumer side to yes, voice advocacy from, you know, the regulation and policy side. But I also think, you know, the patients and consumers hold a lot of power in just the industry. Like they're, they're the buying power, right? Like if they don't buy these products, these brands aren't around, you know? And I think there's just a lot of opportunity for the patients and consumers to kind of take control of that and, and really start to say like, you know, we, we want transparency on these products. We want to know the data on how these products are performing. We want to see which products are performing best for, you know, what reasons that we're trying to buy them for. And um, yeah, I just, I wanted to, ch to provide a different perspective there because I think, again, the regulation policy and, and side of things is obviously needed and there's a lot of power in the people there. But again, cannabis and CBD was a grassroots move movement. You know, we wouldn't have this conversation if it wasn't for a bunch of diehard advocates that fought like crazy to get the industry here, you know? And I just, I still feel strongly that there is the power of the crowd, the power of the community. And 
you know, look, all we're really doing is just reporting what the crowd and the community say, and we're, we're shining light on that data. And I think if that is more of the, the guiding voice of where consumers want to focus their, where they're getting their products from, I think that goes a long way in just like raising the overall standard of these products and brands in the industry. That's great advice because we get a lot of questions that I can't answer. Even with advocacy, <laughs> they, people want to advocate in this space and how do they do it and go start. And I mean, it's just even breaking down those barriers for understanding what products to use, who right. to rely on. So there's so many questions that always come up. So this is a great conversation to have some clarity. And then also how patients can be more involved if this is something they want to advocate for. So I love the two levels because I know on the federal level, it's really tough. <laughs> it's really tough to bring that conversation into our representatives, especially if you don't know what their take is. And so we always have to do research ahead of time. Uh, I know in the chronic pain space, that is always a difficult discussion. So I like how you took a grassroots uh, to the brands itself. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I know and I can imagine how tiring and exhausting and frustrating it could be advocating on like the government side of things. So, so uh, while that's great and that, that's needed and there's a couple of people who are really, really good at it, I think there's a whole other world that, you know, can, can have just as much influence and power as well. Yeah, that's what we're trying to like give and empower the patients to do and use their voices in the way that they feel comfortable using and then also just because some people are really energized to get more involved in this space and we never really have a complete answer. So that's why we do interviews with people in the industry to help them. And if you want to get involved, these are ways to do it and support this type of research as well. And um, also just advocate for different companies out there and get connected. Mm -hmm. So I, I love this conversation as it goes in. Um, but now, okay, so our support fiber friends want to know more of the details or whatever you can share, because I know research is difficult when you start out uh, to share and the details of it. But it looks like, so this new project is for California residents living with fibromyalgia and other chronic pain conditions, correct? correct. Uh, can you share a little bit more details on the, this particular research project? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll kind of give some high level. And Dan, if you want to go into some of the detail, please fill in the blanks for me. Um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, focused on um, patients living in the state of California that have been diagnosed with uh, fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, or osteoarthritis. Um, there's two brands that are sponsoring the study with us. And between those two brands, there's three different products that the participants will you know, essentially get randomized to use. Um, our one brand is Level. They are a licensed California operator. And they have um, unique tablets that they um, formulated very specific for condition-specific efficacy. And what's interesting with, with those tablets is it's not like, okay, here's just a THC tablet, you know, have at it. There's very unique formulations of a wide range of cannabinoids that are built into these tablets, which will, I think, in my personal opinion, you know, I'm interested to hear Dan's thoughts, but like, there's some interesting cannabinoids in there that haven't been studied at all or have been studied very little. So like the fact that we're taking not only individual cannabinoids that have very little data on them, but now merging them with a bunch of other cannabinoids, it's, it's just going to get really interesting as we approach this of like, let's take medical cannabis seriously. Like, let's look at the formulation of these products and let's see what is actually driving the highest efficacy. Um, so anyway, that's, that's our one sponsor. And the other sponsor is uh, a company called Overcome. They are a CBD brand. And again, they have a really unique CBD capsule that has a unique formulation to it as well. Um, and those are the two brands. Those are the three products. And it's specific to the state of California. And the beauty of it is with us collaborating on this is the participants don't have to go anywhere. They can do all of this from the, the comfort and safety of their own home. So we worked with our partners um, on the, the sponsor side and, and different delivery partners in the state of California so that when they sign up for the study, a product is sent directly to their door. If they need to reorder a product, we can streamline that all through the software and again, have a product delivered directly to their door. And the uh, answering and participation of the questions is all done via text message. So if you have a smartphone and you can answer text messages, you, know, you can pretty much participate in the study. Um, text messages will be sent out to people, um, I think it's every evening, and they'll click a link, they'll land on a page, and more or less they'll go through and either slide a bar up and down or, or click a dot for multiple choice options. And that's the extent of their, their participation. Um, 
Dan, I don't know if you want to fill in any of the blanks or Melissa, if you had further questions there, but that's kind of the, the high level view of it at least. Yeah, yeah. So California residents who have uh, chronic pain conditions, so fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, and osteoarthritis of the knee or hip, these are chronic pain conditions that have different sorts of mechanisms in the body. So that's one of the reasons why we're selecting those. And uh, the different cannabinoid compositions, this is really so like the cutting edge of, of research because cannabis is, it's complicated. You know, it's a plant that has hundreds of different cannabinoids and then other compounds like terpenes. It's, you know, it's much more complex than alcohol, which, you know, alcohol is just ethyl alcohol. It's just like one substance. And the question is, uh, you know, what, what are individual cannabinoids doing? How do they work together? So for example, most people have now heard of THC and CBD. And one thing that people are finding that some that CBD some can can help balance out some of the effects of THC. So THC can can be anxiety provoking for some folks. So that people might recommend, okay, well, well, don't take a strain or a cannabis product that's just really, really high in THC and really low in CBD if you tend to get anxious. You know, try try something that has more of a balanced ratio with THC and CBD if anxiety, things like that is a concern. So we're we're just at the beginning of learning how these different cannabinoids, you know, act, you know, interact with each other and seeing what what compositions might be optimally effective for for different sorts of conditions. And it really is um just the beginning because again, there's hundreds of of natural cannabinoids. And then also people are synthesizing, you know, new compounds from cannabinoids. Uh, so there's now an ever increasing list of acronyms for different, you know, synthetic cannabinoids that, uh, that are being developed. And again, this is not, it's not just like there's one thing, there's hundreds of different things that we need to investigate and find out what their properties are and, you know, really, really do a lot of uh, in-depth sorting. Oh, this is fantastic. And then I can nerd out because I used to, I was researching some of this as a vegetable gardener and then being in California with thinking of the different hybrids. Like I thought about this because we had so many people asking questions. So I was diving into the research. So there's so many different properties on the medicinal side and how each of them work. I think that's where it gets even more confusing with what people use and then like you mentioned, if you're more sensitive to THC, like I am, so diving into these other aspects of what you could use, but it's so fascinating, all the the process and then just even how it comes together and how you can process it in your body. So mm -hmm. I, that's why this is important to have this research to provide more clarity, because um, I know the medicinal properties can be utilized and then how to use it how to integrate it into your life better. So uh, I, I'm stoked to hear more about the research, which is actually an important piece that we kind of drive home with support fibromyalgia is as you progress through this, is there ways to just stay up on top of the research and the progression? Are you going to be making announcements as you go? What, what, what are the rules for this? Yeah. So um, in like real time as they're participating, um, just because of research, there's not going to be like, updates on like, oh, you're progressing or de uh, degressing in, you know, X capacity. Um, Cause we just need people to participate and complete it and kind of stay focused on their day-to-day -day activities and answer the questions per that. But yeah, on the back end, you know, we want to share the results kind of as loud and proud and far and wide, wide as we can, you know? So, um, and Dan can, can probably weigh in here more than I can, but obviously we would want to get this, uh, take the study and get it published in a journal so we can really draw a lot of attention to it. But you know, that's just an overall analysis of the overall data set. There's endless opportunities of the data that we could kind of divide and chop up and do kind of like micro reports for lack of better words and share that back out with everybody. And I think that was one of the reasons why we were so interested in, you know, partnering, collaborating with your group on this is because, you know, us as a company and, and the University of Michigan, like our reach is only so far, you know, and specifically our reach within these these patient communities is only so far because like we haven't spent years building a fibromyalgia patient community, you know, um, but like it's it's great to work with these groups that 
are really wrapped around education, are really wrapped around research, where if we're going to go out and do this research and we have the interest of like, hey, let's get this data as out there as we possibly can, it's perfect to work with a group like you where on a regular basis, probably for weeks, if we really wanted to, we could just continue to look at different subsets of the data, put together uh, like little reports and boom, put that out there and just continue to push that data out to help people make more decisions, get more aware, et cetera. Dan, I don't know, again, you're, you're much more on the data analysis and reporting side of things than I am. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I get very excited about data. And, <laughs> you know, in the academic process, we will take our, our project and then submit a manuscript to a peer reviewed journal. So then it goes to people who are experts in the fields that this relates to, and they review it and critique it. And this is part of the process of science where, uh, you know, you really want to know whether this study, uh, you know, how strong is this evidence, right? Uh, and, and we believe we have a solid research design because it's, you know, based on best practices and we're, you know, emulating the kind of cl- clinical trials that you see, uh, you know, for pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're, we're very, we have a very good track record of uh, publishing in the top uh, cannabis related academic journals. So, so given that, uh, you know, we're going to submit it, submit our results to one of these, um, you know, peer reviewed journals, and that will be an extra stage of vetting uh, another way to, you know, build trust that other people who are not involved in the work, they can examine it and they can say, okay, we we believe this uh, and we trust the science. So then, once we once we do publish it, you know, we will disseminate this as wide and far as we can, and we'll be grateful for your help with that because one of the themes of my work is bringing the data back to the people, you know, back to the participants, back to the community where the data comes from to do some some sort of good and and bring some sort of practical benefit. So we'll. Uh, We'll, we'll be in touch and we, we look forward to, to sharing this with you. That is fantastic because with we, we talk about this with the fibromyalgia community. A lot of people participate in stuff, our research, and or they fill out surveys and they never know. Never hear happens. back. No. no. And, and we this has been decades. I've been a fibromyalgia patient for over 20 years and I filled out so many things. I was like, what happened to that? Or where was that investment? So where is it? So I I love what you said. It aligns so much with what we're trying to do with our fibromyalgia research and action. We want the patients to rally around you and they know that this is important, but they're just, I think they got burnt out a little bit. So we're, we're building that momentum, getting the information to them through video content, shared blogs, social media. We'll be doing reels too. So I don't know, maybe we can get Tyler to dance in a reel or something like that. (laughs) Why do I got to be the one that dances? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, just to piggyback off of the reporting, you know, that's one of the things for these participants too, um, you know, because the study is going to be facilitated via the text message, you know, assuming they don't like opt out of the study or anything throughout the uh, period, we'll be able to start texting results back to them as well. So like, we'll be able to, after we work with Dan and team to start doing some of the, re- the analysis and put together some of the reporting, like we could just kind of continuously, at least for those specific participants, they could just get updates on their phone, you know, at a certain period. The thing I, I try to say is like, you know, be patient with us because, you know, Dan's not going to turn it around in an hour so that we <laughs> put it out the next day. So we need some time to actually come through it. But yeah, like once we have it, it's, you know, as much as we can share it, we're going to look to share it. Okay. That, yeah, that's just what we're looking for. We know the results take time, <laughs> but bringing, we, we bring back the researchers. So we talk to them in the starting point and then we check in, we can share updates, but then obviously when the results come out, we, we try to bring people back in to do another interview to share or present. Uh, we'll be hosting a fibromyalgia conference too. So I think this will nice. be a continuous theme for our organization moving forward. But I hear the excitement in the community and from both of you. So it sounds like there's a lot more optimism now in this research area. Is that correct? I would say so. I think, you know, to my comment earlier where it's like you you historically were talking to a lot of brands and they were just like, my products are going to sell more frequently, not a lot of times, but more frequently now, 
there are conversations with brands where it's like, look, we, we need to get better data. We need to understand how our patients or our consumers are using these products, why they're using these products, what impact they're having on them. Um, so yeah, I, I think times are changing, you know, and I think it's, again, largely like, sure, the industry is just maturing and sophisticating, but it's also the patient and the consumer is too. And that goes back to my earlier comment, you know, as patients and consumers get more educated, more aware, and just more open to the fact that these products are available, you know, similar to most things, like you're not going to go out and buy a product that's bad for you, or you're not going to go out and buy a product that like, you don't know what it's going to do to you. Like you're going to go out and buy something that's trusted to a certain extent. Right. And like trusted right now, there's a pretty wide spectrum of like what's considered trusted, right? Like, you know, you telling me something is good might make that product trusted versus me seeing data on that product might make that, that product trusted. But I I think the tides are changing. Um, You know, the, the priority around doing research and getting data on products and making that more transparent to patients and consumers is becoming more of a, of a priority or at least more of an understanding from these brands that like, you know, we should probably either start doing this or start looking at it. And again, I, I put a lot of that uh, credit towards the patients and consumers. Like if they're going to, if they prioritize that, the brands have no choice but to prioritize that if they want to stay in business. Well, I appreciate both of your time coming in here. Thank you so much for sharing. I know for our California residents, we'll be sure to include the link. Are there other links that we should include in the description for our Support Fibro friends to learn more? Um, I can send them over to you. I think the, the link that gets everybody to like the page that'll give them all the details, we try to keep it really short. So it's relief, R-E-L-E-A-F dot A-T and then slash U-M pain. And that'll take you right to the, the sign up page. It'll give kind of a full description of, you know, hey, this is what you're signing up for if you're interested and, you know, what to do next and everything. Um, but we also have a page on our website that gives a little more details and has like an FAQ and all that fun stuff. So I can, I'll send that over to you in an email. If that's a little longer to, to spell out for everybody. <laughs> Well, well, we'll definitely include this. And again, we're rallying our support fibro friends around the research. So please definitely share with all of your friends around the community. And in the chronic, you said rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis is also included. Okay, correct. Perfect. Yep. So we have a lot of friends in that space as well. So we'll, awesome. we'll get to sharing on social media. Thank you again for your time. Thank you to our support fibro friends for watching and tuning in to another episode of fibromyalgia research in action. Bye everyone. Thank you, Melissa. Bye everyone.